Koto no Mai Hairi Mai. Good evening from the Alumni Relations team at the University of Auckland. I'm Karen Thompson and I'm delighted to welcome you to our fourth Raising the Bar Home Edition. Tonight's topic is, are terrorist monsters or are they ordinary people? Professor Peter O'Connor from the Faculty of Education will address that question shortly. Peter will be joined tonight by our MC, his colleague, Dr. Moy Grigazuski, a research fellow in the Centre for Arts and Social Transformation. Moy will introduce Peter more fully in a minute, and later she'll talk to him about his research before asking the questions you, the audience, have for him. We have two more talks in this series covering gene editing and psychedelic drugs, and we'll share with you the registration link at the end of Peter's presentation. If you've missed any of our three previous talks, you'll find recordings of each on our alumni website. I'll now hand over to Moy, our very capable MC, and enjoy the show. Kia ora koutou katoa. Thank you very much, Karen. And we are sending you a very, very warm welcome from the Centre um, for Arts and Social Transformation. And it's my pleasure and honour to introduce to you today's presenter, um, my dear colleague and the Director of the Centre for Arts and Social Transformation, Professor Peter O'Connor, who's going to think about some challenging questions. Are terrorist monsters or are they ordinary people? But before we begin, there's some housekeeping to talk about, of course. So the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your on-screen Zoom panel is live. Please submit any questions you have from Peter's presentation and we'll be monitor monitoring those as we go along this evening. And you'll also be able to upvote on any questions asked and these questions will move to the top of the Q&A screen. And toward the end of today's webinar, Peter will answer some of the highest rated questions. And now over to you, Peter. Are terrorists monsters or are they humans just like us? Well, kia ora, moi, and na mihi nui a koutou. You know, moi, I had a nightmare the other night um, and I woke to my wife just kind of patting my back and I said to her, how did you know I was having a nightmare? And she said, well, I could just feel your body tense. And it was almost like I could feel your heart and, and, and hear it pounding in your chest and your breathing changed. And those of you who've had a nightmare know that feeling sometimes when something is terrifying you, scaring you so much that, that you can't move your feet, you're, you're, you're just paralyzed with with fear, and that was how it felt in the, in the nightmare. And that when I went to call for help, no sound came. An extraordinary thing about the world is that there are people, terrorists, whose goal and aim is to induce that same feeling into people not just individuals, but whole communities, whole nations paralyzed, their voice stripped and taken from them. So tonight when we are talking about this deeply complex issue of what is a terrorist, it's important to understand that this is not just an academic discourse. And I need to ensure at the very beginning that I recognize, respect, and acknowledge that for many people in New Zealand, this is way beyond an academic discourse. It's been part of their lived experience, either very recently because of the events in Christchurch, but also for our refugees and our migrants who've come from places where they have been the victims of people who have set about deliberately to terrify them, to reduce them from being active citizens in the world, to kill them and in killing them, scare and terrify everybody else. 
we live in an age where the appeal of radicalizing and dehumanizing ideologies is becoming more attractive, especially for young people. When you look across the world and the rise in particular of white supremacy, that it's found in the fertile ground of uh, rapid uh, and growing inequality with political systems which reinforce racist discourse, that that appeal is then magnified inside the echo chambers of social media. You know, the Facebook world where so many young people and older people get to understand the world through algorithms which drive them to only see one part of it. The world that we sit in now, Ziyadan Sadar, an extraordinary Muslim scholar, described these times as post-normal. And when he talked about the post-normal, what he, what, what he talked about was this idea that we have got to a part in, in our history as a planet where there's no longer any sense of what normal might mean, that old orthodoxies have gone, that there's no sense really, or no collective sense of the future and no reassurance in the past. And that this time that we live in is one of, and he uses three C's to describe it, contradiction, complexity, and crisis. And we see in the contradictions of our times that we have an extraordinary access to information, but not knowledge. That at the same time as the pandemic has thrown millions into poverty, we've had eight human beings gather up more wealth than over 50% of the rest of the planet. That while we have a growing knowledge and understanding of facts, we have alternative facts, other people's facts. And that, other, that, that, that us as people in this post-normal world are faced with these contradictions that don't make sense. That in terms of complexity, we have intractable problems. The Middle East is, as, 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 as an example of a, it's, it's so complex. How do we actually arrive at solutions? How do we find our way out? And as a planet, we live in constant crisis. You know, in January of 2020, I was working in, in, in Australia because the, the continent was literally on fire. The skies of Auckland were black from the smoke. And then we end in a, in, a, in a pandemic, the shape and scale of what it's done for human life, for economies, for, for everything beyond what we might have imagined. And then amongst that, what we've found is people offering cheap, easy answers, the kinds of things which lure people into finding the scapegoat, finding the other to blame for their lack of ability to deal with post-normal times of contradiction, of complexity, of seemingly never-ending crisis. But you know, we've been here before, you know, not, not quite to the same scale and, and intensity of these post-normal times, but I think back to that period after the Second World War, where democracies had taken on the evils of Nazism, was confronting the, the ideologies, the dehumanizing ideologies of Stalinism. And what we understood in the global north or in the western hemisphere was that progressive policies was one way to protect democracy 
was one way to answer back to those kind of radicalizing and dehumanizing ideologies. And John Dewey understood that the ball walk, the treasure was education, that it was a particular kind of education that ensured that democracy could be uh, protected. It was part of, as I said, a whole range of progressive policies. So what we, we knew was, so that people wouldn't be attracted to those kinds of ways of thinking, you work really hard around wealth inequality. And so we had progressive tax systems, which actually put the burden on the wealthy, that we understood that having a stake in a democracy, which was centered around home ownership for many, was vital, was important, that you worked against communities which had intergenerational cultures of despair. And perhaps where we find now in post-normal times, a readiness and a willingness to blame the others for where we've ended up. So, you know, the, the, the distress that I feel sometimes deep in my bones, that the displaced, the refugees of this world who are the victims of terrorism are so casually by leaders of you know, former presidents of the United States labeled as terrorists, as threats to democracy, when in fact they are the victims of, and that people of color in particular has suffered under the weight and the burden of systemic racism and increasingly are threatened by the rise of white supremacy across the world because it finds its home in post-normal times. Dewey understood that the kind of education that was needed in schools to address these issues needed to have it as hard. The arts, which is why I guess, Moy, we're doing this presentation from the Center for Arts and Social Transformation. There's a long history which understands that the arts, in particular, have a role in changing the world to be a more just, fair, equitable place. And that there's a long tradition and history of how the arts can manage that in schools. You know, we can talk at this high level for a while, Moi, but what I thought I'd do is just to give an example of what that might look like in a school. So I've been teaching about terrorism for coming up 20 years. And I've been using a really simple story, Billy Goat's Gruff. Now, in Billy Goat's Gruff, there's a monster, a troll, who sits under a bridge and his job his mission in life is to scare uh, living daylights out of goats who walk, trip trot actually, trip trot across the bridge. What if we played inside that story and began to think about why there's somebody who sits underneath a bridge? What's led him to be there? How might you open that up through theater, through dance, through movement? through the story itself, for children to begin to think about what it is to see trolls, perhaps it's not too different to themselves, but they've got somewhere else because of all the kinds of things which take people to sit under bridges to scare those who would cross that bridge. So the sense that I have about the possibilities of the arts is that story in that sense has always been about how we learn the moral values of the world. All religions use story to make sense of the world. All education centers at one level on the way in which we make sense through story. 
if we use Billy Goat's graph, we don't actually have to talk even about terrorism, but we can talk about what it is to be the goat who's scared to cross the bridge. We can talk about how we steel ourselves to continue, even though we know that there are those who would, would deliberately seek our harm. We can do all that because the story protects us into not just thinking about these things, but also feeling them. And the key perhaps to much of this is to think about why someone would sit underneath a bridge to scare goats. Blameless goats who trip trot across a bridge to see what kills empathy. So for me, when people say, what do we do with one of the most complex issues that face us? It's so easy to say, oh, well, it's education. But it's a particular kind of education that we need. Not necessarily the kind of education that we have in schools now. We need an education that has at its heart an understanding that the arts can take us to places that nothing else can to understand the complexity of life. We need to be, as John Dewey understood, Clarence Beebe and Peter Fraser back in the 1940s, that you needed to create critical, creative citizens, people who didn't just seek simple answers, but could question answers based on a critical, understanding of the world in which they live. And that seems to me to be what's so important. So it's about saying, let's not just dismiss terrorists as monsters. Let's deal with the complexity of that. Let's discuss how we enable that to happen in our country and in our world. We need to have an education system that develops critical empathy. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later, Moy. But this idea that actually to survive post-normal times, it won't be literacy and numeracy that gets us there. It will be about the way in which we develop empathy for the other and seeing the other in ourselves and ourselves in the other. That's, that's the key. That's the most important thing schools can do for so many. You know, I was very fortunate to have Dorothy Heathcote as my mentor, an extraordinary arts educator. And the last time I saw her, she asked me this question. She knew I was still working in education in New Zealand. And she said, so Peter, in New Zealand schools, do children do things that matter? And in doing that, do they know they matter too? You know, I look at all the, the, the reform, reform and the refreshing that the, the ministry's doing, and I search for words like empathy, for criticality, for things that matter, and I struggle to find them. And so the challenge really is, if we're going to address this question of terrorism and what it means, education's a vital role and place in making the change. And I think why I was instructed to speak for 20 minutes, and I've done that. Yeah. So it's up to you, my friend. <laughs> Peter, you've, you've chosen a very... <coughs> very challenging topic to talk about tonight and i'm interested what is your personal connection to this topic there's a number of personal connections um and one of them is that my great-grandfather was a terrorist he belonged to a terrorist organization he belonged um to um, a precursor of the uh, Irish Republican Army. And in our family, he was a freedom fighter. He was a hero. He was romanticized, as were all the great um, 
Irish men and women who lived, died, and fought for, for freedom. And, and, and so there's a very personal kind of historical connection. You know, I, I was brought up to have a deep, deep suspicion of the English. You know, it was part of who we were and how we saw ourselves in the world. So I understand how these things are shaped cross generation. Um, the romantic patina, you know, of the Irish rebel songs, when you listen to them, are celebrating murder. You know, that there was a, 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 an echo chamber, which was my family, which privileged this extraordinary story of how my great grandfather came here because he murdered somebody. And we were proud of it as his great grandchildren. So, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a sense there of, of that personal connection. The other one that um, I wanted to, that, that draws me to this is that 20 years ago, and I said it was 20 years since I started teaching about this, I, I remember uh, September 11, and my daughter went to school. And when she went to school, they sat around all day. And when they sat around, all day about um, they, they spent the day watching the planes smash into the Twin Towers. The next day, uh, my daughter, who was in year nine at the time, went to school, TVs were gone, and one of the teachers says, it's time to get back to the curriculum. And I remember thinking, there's this thing, isn't it, which is, there's the world happening out here with all its questions, all this stuff. And I don't know if it's, it's not necessarily appropriate that they dealt with that the next day, but they never dealt with it. And you were talking about your experience in Germany. It was absolutely the same for me. For a very long time, I didn't understand what had happened. Because I was, how old were we? Were we at the time? 20 like, years ago, so you were 12, 13? 12, 13, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just didn't understand. And we just had to go back to school because there were tests to be written and yeah. exams to be completed. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's this feeling of real genuine understanding of the world happens in those kinds of moments where we can talk about so much. I can understand why why teachers don't want to teach about that. Me too. Because they're not trained to. They, you know, and, and, and they're worried about, uh, about what it will bring up. They don't know how to use the arts to provide protection into kind of thinking about and talking about that. So what was really interesting, the other thing that happened was about a month after that, there were ter uh, there, in Afghanistan, I understood that terrorists went to terrorist training camps. They went to terrorist schools where they learned to be terrorists. And I thought if you can learn that, you can unlearn, you can deconstruct it as well. So I was really interested in that. You know, the, 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 the thing about Christchurch and the, and, the, and, the, and the terror attacks, and I was thinking I didn't, don't really want to talk too much about that tonight, but there were children who were locked down in Christchurch for hours under desks. And when schools reopened on Monday, many of them went back as if nothing had happened, nothing had changed. And I wonder, what have we done? What are we doing? Where are the units of work? Where are the ways in which we are helping young people to make sense of this part of who we are as a nation? You know. This is who we are as New Zealand. This happened in New Zealand. This is, you know, this happened because of who we are. And how do we teach that? How do we begin to find ways for, for young ones to understand that? So that's, that's the personal connection. But I wanted to ask you this question, Moy, if I oh, could. Oh, okay. You know, I just tipped the table <laughs> up, you know. So, you know, I asked a number of people to, to yeah. do your role. Okay. And they all said no. Mm. So why do you think they said no? Why didn't they want to 
join tonight to talk about this? It's a challenging subject, isn't it? <coughs> um, and I think, you know, we've got a, an hour with our audience today. That's a very short time to, to deeply and richly discuss questions like, are terrorists monsters or are they humans just like us? So I think there might be a fear of um, simplifying matters and not wanting to, you know, come across as simplifying matters. So it is really, really tricky. And then the simplifying being misinterpreted. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I mean, it's been really, it's been a really interesting experience, you know, and I did a similar talk to this uh, a, a number of years ago and, and talked even more about my great grandfather then because I was actually in the bar that he yeah. washed up to in, 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 in New Zealand. But um, doing a Google search, around this and, and, and wondering who's watching you doing the Google search, kind of talking about things. And this is a problem with, I think that we have as a, as a, as a, as a country, we find it really difficult to talk about really difficult things mm -hmm. and we push it away, you know, and we find that really difficult in classrooms and schools. You know, so the other project that we're working on at the moment is with the Sir John Kerwin Foundation. Mm -hmm. So we're working in primary schools, using the arts to explore issues around mental health. And that's tricky work too. But tricky work is really important to do. And it's really important in my sense that universities are part of that conversation and leading some of it as well. So Peter, we've already got a few questions coming in here. Oh, great. Um, which is awesome. And um, our question at the top here at the moment is, Peter, can you give some more examples of how schools can help children develop critical empathy? Well, I could, Moy, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only saying this because we did, we, we did this work together. Uh, me as your supervisor, as you did your PhD, but your PhD really looking in particular at the rise of, of nationalism and neo-fascist groups in, in Germany, and thinking about that, are you, do you want to talk about how you used Home and Away or, or yeah. and, and, and how you did that and the importance of that kind of work? Yes, yeah, so I, I work with young people in Germany. My, my um, passion was and still is finding ways to really challenge right-wing populist rhetoric, which is on the rise and has been on the rise for several years across the global north and especially in the former um, East Germany as well. So I used a picture book, Home and Away, and used participatory theatre, um, a participatory theatre approach to unpack with young people what's certain rhetoric that's exclusionary and that is othering other people, in this case refugees, what, what it actually does and what might actually sit behind it. So we used um, embodied processes, so trying to really embody, make images out of certain statements taken from Twitter or just from mainstream news, shockingly. And by making embodied representations, we, we try to deconstruct these notions. So the yards, in this case, theater provided a certain distance to the very challenging material that we discussed. You know, the other work that I was thinking about that we, we do together is everyday theatre. Mm. And everyday theatre looks at, with year seven and eight children, family violence and child mm. abuse. And we've been doing that work for nearly 20 years. And we have a father in that family who's deeply abusive. Mm. But what we're really interested in in, in, in that work is is not simplifying, but complexifying. So one of the, say, so two of the questions that children always want to ask us when we do that work and they, and they meet Dave in our story, and when they meet him, they want to know two things often. Even though you hit your child, do you still love him? Because there's a complexity around violence and love and families, which eight-year-olds want to understand. They, 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 and Dave isn't just a monster. Dave's an inadequate mess of a man trapped in all sorts of different ways. And the, the worst thing you could do is to simplify it and make 
make Dave a monster. Actually, what you need to do is to understand the deeply human mess that he is so that you can actually start to make a difference, mm. start to help. Now, the important thing about this work around terrorism is that if we have a richer and deeper understanding of what sits underneath it as a nation, then we can actually truly begin to address it. But once you just start doing the, the mad, bad and sad notion, you know, what are we left with? Mm. Surveillance. And actually, we know it's not enough. And an important um, thing, I'm still, I'm still in the classroom doing everyday theatre and it, 99% of the time it starts like this, Dave, who's the abusive father, is lazy and he is a bit of a monster. Why else would he do that? So it is really important to really unpack what is going on, but I think important for us is to emphasise that we're not asking for unconditional empathy with someone who commits acts that are inhumane and that are hurting other people. But we're asking for critical empathy and framing the contexts and understanding and unpacking the context in which acts and attitudes and ideologies flourish. Mm. Reducing things to individual kind of motivations might, might actually get you very far, but placing them within a wider social cultural context um, is the answer, perhaps, or one perhaps, of the answers. Perhaps, perhaps. We've got a question at the top. How do you unradicalize someone who has become radicalized? I was listening um, on, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. People will say that's a great question. They use that to, to, to gain a couple of seconds to think about the answer. I was listening to uh, a, a colleague, uh, Professor Douglas Pratt yesterday on, um, on television talking about this, this young radicalized woman uh, who was uh, a member of ISIS, um, who's been um, deported back to New Zealand. And he talked about habilitating her. And I was deeply fascinated by, by Doug's comments. And what he, what, what he was really talking about was about surrounding her with love. And the great tenets of the Muslim faith is one of love and forgiveness and that she would need to, to connect to that part of her faith and that she would do that by building relationships and networks in when she came home and the, the importance of that. It's not about a deep programming program, but it's back to, it's, it's really about back to progressive politics, which is around how do you feel like you have a stake, that you have a place, that you have, you have something which belongs to you as a citizen of the state in which you live. And I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, once someone's been radicalized, de-radical, that's, that's not my area of mm. expertise, which is why I've drawn on what Doug, Doug was saying yesterday morning in, in, in that sense. And he spoke of, of, of that importance. You, you know, here's the huge thing at, a, at an even bigger scale. How the hell does the United States pull itself back from where it's got with, with, with the terrorists who stormed the Capitol building, who some members of parliament confused terrorism for tourism? So describe them as tourists who were there, who still buy into the big lie, that have propaganda networks which push a particular narrative which we know is, 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 is just lies. And that, 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 that you know, how, how you de-radicalise 40, you know, whatever percentage of the American population now doesn't believe in democracy, is willing to, to storm the very bedrock of it. And if you think about how that was played by Trump, demonizing the other, finding a scapegoat, coming down the escalator, literally talking about Mexicans as rapists, drug smugglers, and then seeing within six years, thousands storm the Capitol buildings actually very quick. And what you see with, uh, with, uh, with the echo chamber of 
social media, how quickly you can radicalize large parts of a population who are already, you know, because of the history of racism in the nation, we're ready for it anyway. Mm. Have I just yeah. tricked into something else here more? <laughs> You're looking a bit worried. Yeah. Yeah, then. Um, <laughs> But we have a few other interesting questions um, here, Ron Zuma. This is another invitation for our audience, for all of you to share with us your questions to Peter, um, if you have some. We have one question here. How do we develop critical empathy in children once their parents have brought them to an age where they're at school with no introduction to the importance of others' perspectives? Yeah, yeah, it's a, another great question, Fiona, and it, it, it speaks about the limit of what you can do in schools and what the limits should naturally be in schools as well. You know, children are socialised and all sort. you know, the casual racism which, which, which might exist in, in, in a home or the othering which occurs and, and all those kinds of ways shapes children in ways that you know, you know, schools schools have a critical responsibility in there, which doesn't detract from the critical responsibility of parents to model the kinds of, of ways of being in the world that we should all strive towards. It's really tricky and difficult in these times, enormous pressure on on parents to get it right. But this one's a really important one to get right. We need to get this one right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, shall we talk yeah, about another yeah. interesting question? Moy's just pointing to an interesting, yeah. another interesting question. Yeah, so this question is, um, <coughs> I heard you speak a few years ago about this in a bar. Me too. <laughs> um, could you ever imagine the Christchurch mosque attacks? then i um in preparation for for tonight's talk looked again at that talk that i gave um about four years ago i think in the very first raising the bar series and what i also said that night was how easy it was to talk about these things in a bar in auckland rather than a bar in London or a bar in New York because we hadn't had the same direct impact. And of course, I haven't had the same direct impact as Muslim people in Christchurch or Muslim people across the country or people of colour who kind of walked around this country for a very long time and some still do as if there's a target on their back. It feels very different to be doing this tonight uh, to when I did it then. Uh, harder, mm. trickier, uh, riskier. Um, you know, I, I was asked to reprise that talk tonight. So I looked at it and I thought, I, I, I can't do that. Things, things have shifted and changed in my own life, in my own world, and in, in, in our world as a in our worlds in New Zealand. But the importance of developing critical empathy, of developing critical creative citizens who can question easy answers is probably in my mind now more important than it was. I think of the recommendations that came out of the inquiry, which was that we needed to have national conversations, not restricted to a gathering in Christchurch once a year, but a real genuine dialogue of the people across. So, you know, as you said, Moy, you know, when I asked you if you do it, it's kind of, I'm not sure I really want to do this, but it's really important. We have got a question at the very, very top. Oh, I'm just having a look too, Moy. Yeah, so this question says, <coughs> with most of these labels, terrorist, pirate, soldier, sailor, the other versus the norm, being made and defined by the controlling powers. How much importance can we give these labels and do they actually have meaning? 
a tricky question. It is a tricky question. I, th I think labels often mean, labels, often, labels obviously mean different things to different people, but labels often are, are very important to, to individuals. I, I have particular labels for myself, father, grandfather, husband, um, friend, all sorts of roles that I play in, in, in my life. If I think of my great grandfather and then um, he, he was, we labeled him mm -hmm. freedom fighter. It's taken a long time for me to come to a sense that he was that plus something else. And I'm still working on the complexity of that. And why it was so important for my father that he clung on to the romantic notion of that label, freedom fighter, an Irishman who gave everything for Ireland. So you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? It is tricky. But I guess when we think back to our work in everyday theatre where there's abuse going on, we talk a lot with the children about the importance of naming abuse as abuse and maybe we can think about the importance of naming acts of inhumanity or terror as acts of in inhumanity mm. or terror. You, you know, Paulo Freire says, you know, to change the world, first you have to name the world. Mm. Um, and, and I think there's a truth to that as well. We need to find the right names for the things that have happened. You know, the inability for example, in the United States at the moment, for a whole political party, a refusal to use the word insurrection, to kind of refuse to name what the whole world witnessed. And if you can't name it, you can't address it, you can't change it. I can imagine saying, look, I'd like to, and, and, and the refusal, you know, you know, the refusal of schools to, to kind of get into the mess of this just leaves kids wandering in the dark. We have a question up at the very top. <coughs> the story of colonization informs social transformation in New Zealand. Some might suggest those who came to own New Zealand were terrorists. Did Victorians become trolls? How can Te Tiriti or Waitangi partnership be a vehicle of inclusion for positive social transformation in 2021? Well, I have done the troll drama on Marae with largely Māori participants in the drama, adults. And the questions that Eric is asking are the questions that we asked ourselves as well. Now, I'm not gonna, you, you know, I think there are multiple answers to that question and it depends on how you want to look at our colonial past. There, of course, been in our history, acts of terror that established colonial rule. The importance of us understanding that in classrooms and teaching that will be part of how we develop critical empathetic citizens, that we understand our history and we understand how we've ended up where we've ended up today. So, yes, you know, what is an act of terror? If an act of terror, when I talked about a nightmare, how many of, how many people live a nightmare life in this country as a result? of colonization? Now, I think I know the answer to that. There are many. It's not a dream. It's not something that you wake up from. It's not, although my wife patting my back was, was, was you know, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the power of love to address terror. That, that simple act that she did at three in the morning the other night was kind of like, I'm here, I'll look after you. I know that you're scared. 
So these kinds of things are important as well. We saw that after the terror attack in Christchurch, didn't we? The importance of love. It wasn't hokey love. Mm. It's what Freire and Bell Hooks describe as critical love. And it kind of, it's, it's, it's not reducing it to a 1960s a- anthem, but saying that those things are really important, that we, we understand that there are large parts of this country who feel unable to move, who are unable to move, unable to speak because of the terror of the past. And we have a duty and a right to, um, to fix that. We have a new question pop up here. So what's the common denominator with terrorists? being abused, being radicalized, economic status, or what? I'm wanting to avoid a psychological examination of what leads someone under the bridge in terms of a troll. What we know is that there are social conditions which amplify the opportunities for terrorists to recruit others into the cause. That's around growing inequality, a sense that, that, other, that, that there's an easy, simple answer, and it's the other. And if we attack the other, we reassert our hegemony, our, our power over, then that's the answer. If we have education systems, which train children to answer questions, but not question answers. Then then what you get is the powder key, which is what we've got now. Democracy is under threat in the global north and in the Western world in a way which should be terrifying. You, you, You see it in so many different places. The Netherlands, Germany, You see it in Greece, you see it in the UK, you see it in the United States, you see it across the world where people feel somehow that they're disconnected from society. We see that they are seeking an enemy to blame it on and other end of others for a simple solution. And so, you know, the pandemic is something for us all to survive, but the fallout from the pandemic uh, could be even worse. Yeah, that was a cheerful kind of move ahead. What are you thinking, Moy? Well, I'm thinking about a question that has been in our feed for a long time. At what age do you think this sort of education, educating for and through critical empathy, uh, when should this begin and at what age? Well, I think you can start teaching critical empathy when you're two and three years old. (laughs) I don't think that's about teaching about terrorism, Mm. but modeling as parents and, and, you know, modeling how we talk about each other, modeling how we are with each other, modeling how we don't abuse other people in our cars, modeling all those, all those kinds of things are are really important for, for very little ones. You know, I've taught Billy Goat's graph, not about terrorism, but about bullies. And I've done that with five and six year olds. And they know what it's like to be the goat. And some of them also know what it's like to be the graph. And so you can start teaching those kinds of things at a very early age. I think it's important to start talking, you know, there are some schools in Auckland that are doing some really interesting work around um, terrorism and teaching that in social studies at year 9 and 10 so that's 13, 14 and 15 and I think that's really appropriate kind of a time as a, a thinking about these kinds of things it, it's that question from Dorothy Heathcote are you doing are you teaching things that matter are kids learning things that matter and I think kids find this really um, important to know and to understand. I've got an interesting question at the top here. How do you reach people through institutions like schools, governments, and traditional media 
who don't trust or believe in it? I don't know, um, Emily. <laughs> it's a simple answer. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know how. You, you know. I mean, who's listening tonight? To uh, to mm. to this kind of conversation, um, and how do you? How do we break out of our echo chambers? You know, how do we break out of the echo chamber of the university? Of you know, how do we break our research in? I mean, it's a, it's an enormous question. Um, that I really struggle with all the time. I know it's not going to be by reproducing a journal article read, mm. read and cited by 15 people, mm. but, it, it, but it is about these, these kinds of opportunities to have engagement, to, to ask these kind of questions. If, if anyone who's listening has any answers around that, I'd be really grateful to, to have the answer. What's next, Peter, is a bold question here. These are not normal times. Terrorists, Trump, COVID, etc. Are we getting more resilient or radical? I think we need to get more resistant. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to use the R, the R words there. I think we're having to become resilient because we're being smacked. In you know, how many once in a hundred year storms can we have in a year? How many once in a hundred floods can we have in a year? how many assaults on common decency can we see by the world's leaders or all, all those kinds of things lead us to a heightened anxiety internationally which 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 is part of the post-normal kind of condition that we sit ourselves in trapped between unsure of any future you know Schools are supposed to be futures focused. This is kind of the big thing that was supposed to be sitting under there. And I, you know, I get asked to do strategic plans for the next five years. And I get, you know, here at the university, I go, really? I'm not even sure of the next six months. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I mean, the, uh, those things become really difficult for people. Another interesting question at the top. Um, what do you think? Would there be no need oh i just moved to somewhere else so i can't see it anymore I just bottom one too. i'm good i'm gonna because i started this question i'm <laughs> gonna finish it just to be fair so the question is this would there be need would there be no need for terrorists terrorists if people felt like they have access to opportunity look i don't think it means that the lone person who does evil things but we need to have a society where people feel that they belong and that can imagine their world better than it is and that the world can be better than it is not by attacking and, and, and taking the lives of others so without reducing it to a simple answer because it's more complex than that. The business of how people see the possibility in their lives, you know, lots of studies on, on, on you know, the, the Trump mob, they feel that they got left behind. You know, it's that white, poor section and they looked and they blamed it on a black president who they didn't ever accept was American. They blamed it on Mexicans. They blamed it on refugees. They blamed it on, they blamed it on, they blamed it on because it was impossible to see any opportunity in their lives. So it's obviously an important part, it would seem to me, to how we end up where we end up. And the importance about schools then? Yeah. Schools need to see. <laughs> Kids in schools need to see that they have opportunity. They need to see that, that, that the world, their world and the worlds of others could get better. Simple, really, at that level. Mm -hmm. Pedagogies of hope, again, a Freirean concept. Peter, do you have any advice on where teachers can start or resources? How can teachers connect with your centre or your work? So the Centre for Arts and Social Transformation has um, a website, 
has a number of, of websites that, that set um, itself off that. So you can look up the Centre for Arts and Social Transformation, our research reports, our publications. We have um, a significant number of people here in the, in the centre doing all sorts of work. If you're interested, um, uh, send us an email. Um, I'm there on the university directory. So is Moy, our team here, and we'd be happy to hear with everybody. Do you want to take Brent's last one or have we run out of time? We are actually running out of time, but if you can be quick, we're going to do it. So here's a question. It's, it looks like you're somewhere really interesting. Can you tell us about the art around you in one minute? In one minute, we are in the Centre for Arts and Social Transformation on the Epsom campus of the University of Auckland. And sitting behind Moy and I are, it's some artwork created in the 1950s by children at Orawaiti School by Elwyn Richardson. And what Elwyn was about was about using the arts for social transformation. So we were really thrilled to be able to show it tonight. Excellent. Our time is up. Thank you, Vida, for talking to me and to our audience online today. This is a reminder for all of you that Raising the Bar Home Edition is a series of six speakers over six weeks. Today's speaker, Peter, was the fourth, so there are two more to go, which is very exciting. Um, we hope you'll be able to join us again at one of the other talks. To do this, please check the link in your confirmation email you received to join us today and we'll also show the website address at the end thank you again for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon Kakitiano. Kakite.